The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the reading of God's Word as it is found in Acts chapter 5. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do to these men. For before these days, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as you can gather from the reading... We're in the middle of a story in the book of Acts, and we are seeing everywhere in this book of the Bible that the church is a supernatural work of God. And we see that all throughout the book of Acts. Um, Last week, we saw God's supernatural work when Peter and the other apostles were imprisoned, Um, but an angel came in the middle of the night and set them free and said, listen, I want you to get out of this jail cell. And they were very excited about leaving, walking out. And then the angel said, now go back to the temple and preach Jesus again, which is what got you arrested in the first place. Just go do it all over again. And so they went and preached and they were brought politely to the council this time. They didn't arrest them. They said, would you please come? And Peter was brought before a trial in front of the Sanhedrin. And God gave him the words of life to speak in his trial. And this week we'll look at God's supernatural work in protecting his church through a Pharisee. Let's pray that God opens our eyes to see his word. Our Father, we thank you that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. It is your work to grow the church, to grow us in Christ, to make us more like him, and to um, shave off the rough edges of our sin day by day. And so, Lord, we look to you and we pray that you would give us the spirit of Christ as we open the word of Christ this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you suffered before because you are a Christian? It has been a privilege that I did not expect in becoming a pastor to be brought on the inside of many of your Christian sufferings. And I've often seen 
in your lives where people are angry at you because of something good that you have done. And when I see that as a pastor, I see the glory of Jesus at work in your life. And I know that God has counted you worthy to suffer for the name. That's what I see. I know it's, that doesn't fix anything. It doesn't make it easier. But I get to see the church as you fellowship with Jesus, both in his glory and in his sufferings. If you are counted worthy to suffer, then you should rejoice that God is doing that work in you and use that suffering as a pulpit to tell other people about Jesus. That's what our suffering is for. And we, we see that in this passage, and it's sort of surprising. If you read what Peter said, Peter answered the Sanhedrin in his defense. He's coming before the Supreme Court of Israel. They have 70 elders There's a high priest sitting in the middle and you're surrounded by 35 elders on each side. And you're just standing in the middle of 70 men giving a defense. Peter preached to them and said, we must obey God rather than men. And and in this instance, that means rather than you. And Peter said, and Jesus, you murdered him, but God raised him from the dead And now God is raising Jesus as the prince and the savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And Peter said, I'm not the only one talking to you. So is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to everyone who obeys him. And do you know how they responded? They were really mad. They were really mad. The remarkable thing here to me, there are two things that are a little surprising. The first thing that surprises me about this is how many times God will preach the good news to us. God doesn't say, let me tell you about my son who died on the cross. I will send someone to teach you the gospel. And then if you say, no, I'm not interested in laying down my life and my sin and following Jesus, and you stiff arm the gospel, what does God do? God does not disqualify you. He sends the gospel again and again and again. This same group of the Sanhedrin and the high priests, Annas and Caiaphas, they were there for the ministry of John the Baptist. They were there to interact with Jesus. Now they've interacted with Peter twice. They're hearing the gospel again and again and again. And I'm amazed at the patience of Jesus in sending that good news. That was the first thing that surprised me. The second thing that surprised me is the level of their anger. So it's one thing to get angry. We do that. Someone tells you something you really don't want to hear and you get angry. But look at how angry they were. It said they were enraged and they wanted to kill them. Now that word enraged in the Greek is sawn in two. They they were cut. Or, Or we would say you were cut to the heart. Because Peter came and said, I have to obey God, not you. But there are other reasons why people get angry. Um, at the good news of Jesus. There is uh, a catechism that was written in the time of the Reformation in Heidelberg, Germany, and the Dutch church has adopted it, and it reflects, um, no offense if anyone here is Dutch, it looks like the Dutch culture, um, because this is their question. How do you know your misery? And they want to make sure that everyone knows that we are miserable. And it answers the question by saying the law of God teaches us that we are to love God and that we are to love our neighbor. And the next question is, can you keep these things perfectly? The answer, no, 
because I am prone by nature to hate God and to hate my neighbor. Now, it's one thing to say we're not perfect, we're all sinners, we don't love other people like we should, but to put it in the way that this catechism puts it. What is your problem? What's the problem of your pastor? Our problem is we hate God. When we really see who he is, what he requires of us, what he expects, what he demands, we say, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And when we look at our neighbor, you know, we can cover it in all sorts of nice ways of saying it. But when it comes down to it, you love yourself more than you love your neighbor. And many times we hate our neighbor. Does that make you angry? That's what Peter preached to these powerful men, these 70 angry men. And Peter also preached to them, but don't worry, you're murderers, but God sent Jesus to save murderers. And all you have to do is turn from your sin and God will forgive you. And you know, that also makes people angry. And Some of the people there were Pharisees, and just a short run about Pharisees. The Pharisees believed the Bible was the word of God. They believed in the resurrection from the dead. They believed in heaven and hell. They believed in forgiveness of sins. They believed in angels and demons. They were the conservatives, and there are a number of Pharisees sitting on this council. And if you told the Pharisees, The only thing you need to have your sins completely wiped away. It's not keeping God's 600 laws. And maybe at the end of a really good life, you can be forgiven. Peter said, no, 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 Pharisees, you don't understand. All you have to do is believe in Jesus and you could have been a murderer your whole life. You'll be forgiven. And the Pharisees said, how dare you Look at all my religion, everything I've sacrificed. I fast twice a week. I tithe everything. I go into my, my, um, the spice drawer at home, and I make sure that God gets a tenth of every one of my spices. And the Pharisees said, and you're going to tell me that a murderer or an adulterer can just believe in Jesus and they're forgiven just as clean as I am? And Peter said, yes. And so the Pharisees were also mad. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Now, that sounds really extreme. Does that kind of thing actually happen today? Well, I want to read a story from about a year and a half ago in Arizona. There was a man named Hans preaching on a street corner. And while he was talking about sin and salvation in Jesus, he didn't know what happened and he fell onto the ground and got up um, and got in his car and drove to his wife and met her at church and there was blood coming down his face. And she said, what happened? And he was looking at her and no words were coming out and she ran him to the hospital and they found a bullet lodged in his head. In Arizona, a year and a half ago, a man preaching on the street was shot in the head. Um, He actually was in a coma for a while. He came out of it. Um, He's alive and speaking and living his life today. But this is America in the modern world, someone angry enough at a street preacher to shoot him in the head. This is not just ancient history. People are angry when the gospel is preached today. And it's because they preach this message. This is what the church has to say. God offers grace in the forgiveness of sins. All we need to do is receive it by faith. And to receive that by faith, we just acknowledge that Jesus is the Savior. And in Jesus, we have God's fatherly love given to us and his blood poured out to wash us from our sin. That's the message that the church has, and it makes people angry.
Now, before you get on a high horse and you are horrified at those bad people in the world that are mad, I just want you to know that these angry people are mirrors of your own heart. And as you see their rage, I want you to see a reflection of your native heart. This is every one of us. You are the kind of person who becomes angry at the teaching of salvation and that Jesus Christ is Lord and he gets to tell you when what you do is wrong and he gets to command you whatever he pleases. Salvation from Jesus means this about us. We are hateful and evil and there is no other way out of our evil unless God sends his son to die for us. It is a condemning message. It is a message that lifts up Jesus at the expense of every one of us. And it's a message that says you are a murderer, but you can be forgiven because the prince of life died for you. And one of the perennial reactions to Christianity is rage. So when you see that rage up close, I want you to think that is a mirror of my sin. Well, Peter and the apostles were the victims of this rage. They saw it close up. And it's amazing, the night before, they were delivered from prison by an angel, miraculously delivered. I would think if I saw an angel breaking me out of jail, this is it. I don't think I'll ever have to suffer again. The next morning, there they are, being tried. And instead of being delivered by an angel this time, God sent a Pharisee to deliver Peter. And we have no need to be afraid of anything. Um, There was an old preacher in the 1700s, an evangelist. Thousands of people listened to George Whitfield preach. Thousands of people became Christians through his ministry. And he wrote to another pastor, Do not fear your weak body, because we are immortal until our work is done. Until Jesus has this work for you and you've finished it, You are immortal. That doesn't mean you're invincible. (laughs) And we'll see that later in this story. And God saved Peter through this Pharisee. So as we see in verses 34 to 39, we see that God preserves his church, whatever means he chooses. This Pharisee stood in the council named Gamaliel and There were these two parties. I don't know if you can imagine a two-party system in a nation. But they had two parties, and they had the Sadducees, who had welcomed the Greeks as they came and took over Israel. And later they welcomed the Romans. They loved Greek philosophy. They were highly educated. And they didn't believe in the supernatural. No angels and demons. No resurrection from the dead. They were, they were highly educated. They knew their Plato and their philosophy. And so they were above a lot of what the Bible teaches. They were the more powerful group because the Romans liked them. And so it was a Sadducee who was sitting as the high priest. The other group was the Pharisees. And the Pharisees said, we have the words of God in the writings of Moses. We believe in the Messiah the resurrection from the dead, heaven and hell, angels and demons. And they, they really did not like the Roman Empire. They were very good rule followers. And they often were the rule makers. And you can be really good at following the rules that you decide are the most important. And so the Pharisees were the, the best followers of the rules that they made. And they thought this is our way into God's favor. Well, Gamaliel was a Bible teacher, a member of the Pharisees. He had the respect of this Sanhedrin. And he said, listen, we're going to go into what we call executive session. Send the apostles out of the door. We'll close the door and talk more freely. 
And as they went into this executive session, he spoke to the elders and said, Men, Israelites, take care, control yourselves in what you're about to do to these men. Do not react in thoughtless rage. When you are angry, you are very rarely thinking clearly. Those two things don't usually go together. So he said, just stop, take a moment, and I want you to think about what we're doing. And he said, let me just give two examples of things like this. So Peter said, Jesus is prince or leader or Lord, and he is savior. Those are the two things. And so Gamaliel gives two examples to counter both of these. Does Jesus claim to be the Savior? Well, there was another man. You know, Jesus is not the only man claiming to be Christ in that day. Many people rose up and said, I'm the Messiah sent from God. And so when Jesus came, it was, oh, you too. (laughs) Here we go again. Do you remember Thutis? No, I don't remember Thutis, but they did. And Gamaliel said when he rose up, he claimed to be somebody. And Josephus was an historian at the same time. And Thutis said, I am the prophet that Moses promised. I'm the savior that God is sending. All these men rose up with him. They took arms. They started fighting against Rome. And that doesn't usually end well. And so Thutis and his 400 men were killed. They were scattered. The movement was dead. I've never heard of this man outside of this passage. So is Jesus claiming to be the Messiah? So did Thutis. Second example. There was another man from Galilee. And Peter's there with a Galilean accent. They knew exactly what Gamaliel was saying. There was this man named Judas from Galilee. He claimed to be a king or a lord. Or we don't need to submit to the Roman Empire. They were... um, doing a census, so you need to report how many people that live here so that the Roman Empire can take taxes. And Judas said, this taxation is slavery and we should fight for our freedom. He led an uprising against the Roman Empire. Judas was killed, he was scattered, and no one has ever heard of this movement. And so Gamaliel said, listen, This happens all the time. Jesus, the claims about him that he's the Messiah, the followers, the zealous men, don't worry about it. Gamaliel said, just leave them alone. You don't need to lift a finger. And this was his conclusion. If Christianity is from man, we know exactly what will happen. We get to just see it on the news every couple years, the same thing. And Gamaliel said, but if Jesus and the movement of Christianity is from God, do you know what that means? You cannot tear it down. You can try as they're doing this this building, but if God and his hands are at work, it doesn't matter what you do. You, You cannot bring that tower to the ground. And You probably shouldn't try, because if you do, you will be waging war against God, which I don't think you you want to do that. And so he laid these two options. Either Christianity will collapse under the weight of its own absurdity, or you will declare war against God, and you will lose. So Gamaliel said, just, just let them go. And his counsel won the day. These men were ready to murder Peter and the apostles. They were ready to, to finish the work of the gospel, just kill all of the leaders at once. And Gamaliel took those angry, raging men and persuaded them. This was a, an act of God. And God used this Pharisee to save Peter. Now, there's a great line in our Westminster Confession about God's providence. How does God work in the world? 
God, in his ordinary providence, uses means. So we have laws like gravity. We have things that you do, and there's, there's, God always uses that means. The sun rises up, and that brings heat and light to the earth. But God is free to work without means, above means, and against means at his pleasure. So God can work above the speech of Gamaliel and do more than what it really would have done. And God can even work against the Sanhedrin. And by the end of their meeting, they do the opposite of what they wanted to do. Because God was at work. And God is using a Pharisee to do it, to save his people. And this Pharisee named Gamaliel was the teacher of a young rising star, a student, whose name was Saul. And Gamaliel was teaching Saul, and we should not have the speech of Gamaliel in our Bible because it's an executive session. You're not supposed to tell anyone what was said in the executive session. Who was there with the 70 who reports to Luke, this is what happened? And let me tell you what Gamaliel said when you guys were all kicked out. We hear it because of this student of Gamaliel who was there. And so the elders, they called them back in and said, listen, we made our decision. You're free to go. Oh, that's wonderful. But first we're going to beat you with rods. (laughs) And it's likely that they were beat 39 times until their backs were bleeding. And then we'll send you out. And you are not allowed to preach in the name of Jesus. This is the second time they said. It didn't work the first time. I don't, I don't know why they bothered. But they said, just stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Well, God delivered his people. But they were, the, the Sanhedrin in their anger, they didn't let them go scot-free. They said, no, we're still going to do something in our anger. Have you ever been put to shame in a public way because of Jesus. Well, you should respond this way with the words of Jesus. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. You will be a joy-filled person because God will take care of you. And this is what Peter and the other apostles, how they responded. They left the presence of the council in verse 41 hurt and ashamed and you know that's not what it says <laughs> they left the presence of the council rejoicing is that how you respond when you're you're beat with a rod on your back and you suffer shame and you are in pain at the hands of a wicked government they walked out of that courtroom rejoicing it's <laughs> such a testimony of the work of god I've seen this happen, and it's something I will never forget. Um, I've seen a number, there were six, six people, five men, one woman, at a trial in Nashville for, for standing at an abortion clinic, and most of them just prayed and talked. One of them sat in front of the door, and they were being tried as felons, and eventually they were convicted, all six of them, only one of them has, is, is currently in a in a federal prison today. But when they were convicted, they walked out of the courtroom and they went to the steps in Nashville in front of this courthouse and they began singing, Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. So I was watching six felons singing, Crown Jesus Lord of all. They came out of that courtroom rejoicing. Not because they were going to prison, but because they were counted worthy to suffer with Jesus. These 12 apostles came out of the courtroom with stripes of blood on their backs, and they were rejoicing. They were not cowering in fear and shame, and they went back to their work with fresh commitment. They said, we're going to go tell more people about Jesus. And every day they were preaching and teaching Jesus is the Savior. They were going into people's homes and teaching that. Everybody who would have them into their homes. 
but they didn't even hide in private. They were also publicly going back to the temple under the noses of the Sanhedrin and doing exactly what they were forbidden to do, preaching that Jesus is the Savior. They were fearless. They were joyful. They were committed to their work. And they were evangelizing even through suffering. So don't be surprised when people get angry at the gospel. Because the gospel makes people like us angry. But when people do get angry, you can trust that God will keep his church going. God protects his people. And so what is your call? Keep up the good work. Just get back to work with renewed excitement. Rejoice in the Lord always, even in suffering. Again, I will say rejoice. Amen. Let's pray. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.